Well, hello to those attending online. Appreciate you taking time out of your busy day working from home or your clinical office, wherever you might be. Uh, it'll be my pleasure this morning to introduce Dr. Ari Vanderwald to you here in just a moment uh, for this important webinar on really talking about how we're conducting clinical trials in the area of oncology during a very tricky period of pandemic. Before we get into the formal presentation, a few quick housekeeping notes. Uh, the Q&A section you'll see on your control panel will be active. You can type in a question at any time during the presentation uh, today. And once Dr. Vanderwald has concluded his remarks, and we have a few brief remarks from Sean Hart, the Chief Business Officer of George Clinical, uh, we'll be taking those questions. I will read them. Uh, and if you have any that, that don't get answered during our, our limited time this morning, uh, I will keep an archive of those and a member of the George Clinical team can follow up with you directly on that. So question and answer panel, see that to the bottom of your screen uh, and we'll get started. So Dr. Vanderwald is an internationally recognized researcher providing expertise in oncology clinical trials, focusing on immune therapies for solid tumors and melanoma. His work in the pharmaceutical industry has helped lead the approval of new compounds used to treat melanoma. Along with this experience, he also works as a premier cancer research institute and a scientific expert for George Clinical, specializing in oncology. Dr. Vanderwall has collaborated and participated on advisory boards with many of the nation's thought leaders and top experts in the field while holding a dual appointment with the University of Tennessee Health Science Center as Associate Vice Chancellor of Research and excuse me, Assistant Professor Hematology Oncology. He's involved in research designed to improve treatment for cancer patients by targeting therapy in a more personalized fashion based on immune markers and aberrations in cancer genetics. Without further ado, Dr. Vanderwall. So hello, everybody. Um, I thank you all for joining. Um, and before I start, I want to just issue a disclaimer that all doctors who are talking about the COVID pandemic in any way need to issue. And if you hear anybody say differently, they are not being honest, which is there is a limited amount that we know. There's a lot more that we don't know. Um, and what I'm gonna be talking about today is really what we have learned so far, some of which is true, some of which is the best that we can estimate, and some of which is just historically how things have played out so far. Um, so without further ado, let me tell you a little bit about what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, the first thing we're going to be talking about is what are the risks of COVID for patients with cancer? Patients with cancer are not the same as patients without cancer, and I'm sure you've heard a lot of different mortality and morbidity statistics over the last few months for the general population, for patients who have pre-existing conditions. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about what those risks look like, to the best of our knowledge at least, for patients who have cancer. Then we're going to move a little bit more into uh, what that means for cancer research. What is happening to patient accrual on cancer studies in, during the COVID pandemic? And what are the risks to the best of our ability to be able to quantify uh, on clinical trials? And finally, I wanna propose some ideas on how to create policies or procedures uh, within the pharmaceutical world based on what's happening at a lot of clinical sites um, to allow us to continue cancer research moving forward. So to start, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, what the risks are of COVID for patients with cancer. Uh, the word benefits in there is somewhat uh, disingenuous. There are not really all that many benefits for patients with cancer um, to getting COVID. But it's important to recognize that with any change in the way that we deliver care, there are sometimes unintended consequences that are not necessarily as bad as we might think. So, what we've seen, of course, with the COVID pandemic is a global shift in terms of the way that ind individuals are dealing with each other, dealing with their places of work, dealing with their friends, dealing with their family members. And what we've seen in general is that there's a great deal of self-isolation happening. People are doing a, a great deal more in terms of increased use of technology. Um, this type of webinar is now the norm instead of the exception. Uh, In-person big conferences have basically stopped. Um, and as a result, there are fewer in-person interactions occurring right now in our society. All of these are things that you already know, but being as this is a recorded seminar, hopefully at some point we'll be able to look back on this time and use this information to remind us of the way things were. 
there's definitely a concern for harm among, uh, for COVID among cancer patients. Um, there is, in addition to the risk of COVID among cancer patients, there's the opposite risk as well, and we're gonna be talking about that, which is that as patients are more worried about using the healthcare system, there are potential risks of cancer um, that otherwise might be more advanced or more, might be uh, less easy to detect due to decreased healthcare utilization during the pandemic. And most of what's happening in terms of COVID has, believe it or not, very little to do with local, regional, and national ordinances. Um, much of what we have been doing as a society has been self-imposed. Um, and the local or regional ordinances that have occurred have occurred to some extent on the heels of what we as a society have determined to do, which is one of the reasons that coming out of this uh, self-isolation that we're doing is so spotty. Um, because while local, regional, and national organizations and uh, government officials are telling us that we should take various different phases of reopening, there's a great deal of anxiety and, uh, and general um, uh, uh, different approaches that people are taking. Um, and while society in some ways is opening back up on an individual level, many people are maintaining a lot of the same restrictions, including self-quarantine and self-isolation that they were doing before. So let's talk a little bit about uh, what the risk of death is in patients who have cancer um, that, uh, that get COVID. And again, our data lags. Data tends to lag in terms of the way that science is presented. And as a result, I can't give you exactly what's happened in the last month or so as um, the rates of uh, COVID have gone up in the United States to make the US the most uh, uh, number of COVID infections in the world among all countries at the current time. But we can look back at the beginning of the pandemic a little bit. And this definitely shows us that the risk of, of death in patients with cancer who contract COVID is higher than the norm. Um, the overall rate of all patients that were studied in the early days of the pandemic that was published at the end of February before we started any social distancing measures in the United States um, in Wuhan, which is where this pandemic started, um, was a comprehensive report of what the Chinese experience had been with coronavirus up until that point. And the bulk of what they had uh, it, it, uh, experienced was, um, was largely experienced already by the end of February. And the case fatality rate that they saw in patients with cancer was 7.6%. Another way of saying that is that patients who have cancer who contracted COVID had about a 7.5% chance of dying of it. Um, that's as compared to the overall rate in the population, which was 4%. And remember, these were just of known cases. So while we expect that the overall rate is actually lower than this, this is actually just of the cases that were, they were able to find. And we expect that there are a large number of cases that go undiagnosed that makes these numbers go down a little bit. Those patients who did not have a comorbid condition that were diagnosed with COVID only had about a 1.5, 1.4% chance of dying. And what's interesting is cancer is not the most comorbid condition that patients ended up having. Um, that uh, it didn't have the highest case fatality rate. Patients with hypertension actually had an 8.4% chance of dying with cancer in this population. It's also it, worth recognizing that these are imperfect data. Uh, these were not based on huge numbers like we're seeing in the United States. And so this is the best that we know at this time. Um, there was another study that was also coming out of Hubei province, which is where Wuhan is located in, in China, that showed that there was an odds ratio of death of about two times, a little bit more than two times, um, in patients who uh, were hospitalized with cancer for an overall death rate of 11.4% in patients who had cancer. Now remember, patients who are hospitalized um, with COVID are a, higher like, uh, are a higher risk population. They're more likely to die of any cause, um, but certainly the patients who did not need to get hospitalized had a lower rate of death. And so this does over inflate what the risk of death is in general. Um, it's important also to recognize, and this is a little bit small on your screen, but you can see that those patients who needed to uh, had severe or critical disease those patients with cancer in this yellow bar had a higher risk of mortality than those patients who did not have cancer. Those patients who needed to be in the ICU that had cancer had a higher death rate than patients who did not have cancer. And those patients who ultimately died um, had a higher risk of having cancer than those who did not have cancer. Not all cancers were created equal in this study as well. Um, the highest risk of death was in patients who had hematologic cancers. And those um, hematologic cancers, for those of you who might know, are those who are those patients who are most likely to have severe immune dysfunction as compared to all those others with solid tumors. 
And those patients with lung cancer also had a higher risk of death, which is uh, also not expect, unexpected when you, when you think about it, considering that um, the mechanism of death in the COVID infection tends to be an acute respiratory distress syndrome. And those patients who don't have as, uh, as much lung function to begin with because of their lung cancer are more likely to have severe adverse events when their lungs stop working for other reasons. The next study that I want to talk about is a more recent study, and this is in the early experience that was seen in New York, which all of you know was a hotspot for COVID in the first couple of months of the pandemic in the United States. This is only patients who had, were in one health system in New York, um, and these were only patients that were hospitalized for COVID. And so among a thousand patients who were hospitalized for COVID um, in a control group, they also had a case group of 218 patients who had cancer. Um, and uh, there were 61 deaths among that group as opposed to in the control group where there were 149 deaths. And what that shows was that there was a 25% case fatality rate among patients who had solid tumors and 37% of patients who had hematologic malignancies. Um, this was only an inpatient population, as I mentioned, um, which is a much higher death rate than you'd expect in the general population, either with cancer or without cancer. But it's worth noting that there was a much higher rate in patients who had cancer of death than patients who did not have cancer. And so this is sobering information and it does tell us that patients who have cancer have a higher risk of dying of COVID if they contract COVID than patients who do not. Um, as a result of these increased risks in patients who have cancer, there have been a number of societies that have come up with various different guidelines for how to take care of cancer patients during the COVID pandemic to minimize the risk of getting COVID uh, for those patients who are at risk like those who have cancer. Unfortunately, these guidelines are a little bit all over the map. There are not a standard set of guidelines that every society and every group is, is undertaking. But by going through a few of these types of studies, we can get a sense of the types of different uh, cancer care impacts uh, that the risk of COVID has undertaken. So um, as you can see here, the American Society of Breast Surgeons and the American College of Surgeons has looked specifically at patients who have a diagnosis of breast cancer and tried to come up with some ways to be able to limit the risk of patients from getting COVID during the pandemic. The American Society of Breast Surgeons came up with different priority cases of different types of treatments that patients should be offered when they have breast cancer during the COVID pandemic. And this is not just for patients who have COVID. This is to limit patients who are at risk of COVID by having cancer and therefore at higher risk of death. Um, the first priority that the, that the uh, breast cancer group came up with was a patient who's unstable or has a new diagnosis of the worst kind of breast cancer, which is triple negative breast cancer. These types of patients in general should be offered the same types of treatments that would be available to them if we were not in the COVID pandemic. And largely that's because those types of treatments um, are are more urgent and emergent. Um, you can't really wait on a new diagnosis of triple negative breast cancer. Those patients need to get surgery, they need to get treated, and therefore those are considered to be priority A. Priority B are those patients for whom a delay of about six to eight weeks um, is unlikely to uh, over, uh, impact their overall outcome, but beyond six to eight weeks could impact their overall outcome, and therefore, um, some strategies to kind of push these patients' treatments off by about a month and a half were considered reasonable. Again, these guidelines were undertaken in March, um, which is already about two months ago. And therefore, we're now getting to the point where patients are coming due for these types of treatments that otherwise had been pushed off for a few months, even if the risk of COVID has not dropped too much. Um, but uh, these types of therapies include um, Patients who have ER positive disease, which is less, in, which is a little bit less um, uh, 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 pressing than triple negative disease. Patients who can undergo neoadjuvant therapy a little bit more and don't need to get surgery right away because the highest risk of contra contracting COVID has generally been considered to be invasive surgery. And patients who um, are in later line for palliative chemotherapy with metastatic disease, it's less likely to improve their outcomes. And what you're seeing here is generally a sense of if you can push off the therapy without major risk to the patient, you should do so. Um, and that's what you're getting from the American Society of Breast Surgeons. And then priority C are those patients who really don't need to get the therapy. It's something that is sort of best practice to give them therapy. 
but generally speaking, there is a delay that can be, that can be uh, undertaken during the duration of the COVID-19 pandemic, even for up to a few months to um, a half a year. And those include, for example, um, patients getting uh, zoledronic acid or denosumab for uh, anti-resorptive therapy of their bones. That's not needed urgently. Um, patients who have benign breast disease that is causing difficulty, patients who have um, non-malignant DCIS or things like that, um, and being able to put off uh, routine things like port flushes beyond 12 weeks. So that's what the way that the Society of Breast Surgeons approached breast cancer. On the other hand, uh, different societies, for example, the Colorectal Cancer Alliance, was even more conservative with the way that they wanted to approach doing surgeries and doing chemotherapy for patients um, who have colorectal cancer. And their principles included avoiding the clinic and hospital exposure whenever possible. Um, however, certainly prioritizing patients who are in the curative setting to be able to uh, get cure, to try to do what's possible to reduce myelosuppression, so increasing the general use of, um, of uh, um, uh, GCSF and other uh, neutrophil promoters that otherwise might not have been used, um, doing what's possible to avoid grade three or four toxicity because patients who experience severe toxicity on cancer treatment are more likely to utilize the health system in an erratic and more common type of way, and to consider skipping treatments whenever possible. If you look into the details in this table that was published um, in, in, uh, more recently in Colorectal Cancer Journal, um, uh, you can see that they're even going so far as to saying, don't treat stage two colorectal cancer, um, or at least don't treat it with oxaliplatin, which can be pretty toxic. Um, uh, generally speaking, um, you, you can stop or delay uh, general adjuvant use of oxaliplatin even in stage three disease, um, stopping adjuvant therapy after three months instead of the usual six months. So really taking some pains in order to do things that are really not standard of care, but um, have limited additional benefit uh, to doing them. So it's understanding that the risks and benefits of doing therapy are actually quite uh, modified. Um, and that when you have higher risks on the healthcare side, you have to take higher risks um, in terms of the treatment side and decrease those low risk interventions. Um, the third one that we wanna look at is melanoma, not just because I am a melanoma doctor, but also because this adds an additional element which is the Melanoma Society um, in the NCCN, which is the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, uh, brought up something else that they anticipated, which is that there's going to be some drug supply issues that might be um, impacted as well as uh, supply in general in society goes down as fewer people are able to go into work. And so um, they added into this a little bit of concern, which thankfully to date has not been a problem, um, that, um, that chemotherapy regimens or immunotherapy regimens should be chosen that are the least taxing on the health system um, in general, that use less drug than others, that dose a little bit less commonly than others, um, that generally speaking, we should use less ineffective chemotherapy in late line metastatic disease. And so what you can generally see from all of these different guidelines is that there's a lot of thinking about risk and not just from a risk perspective to the individual patient, but also to a societal risk. Um, the risk that we're talking about is not just the risk to individual cancer patients, but also the risk to the healthcare personnel, um, because the healthcare personnel are the most likely to transmit this to other cancer patients. So if, for example, a nurse gets COVID, she can infect multiple cancer patients with COVID. Um, whereas if a cancer patient is infected with COVID, it's less likely that they're going to be around other cancer patients. And as a result of that, it's very important that we limit healthcare interventions and interactions. So how has this really impacted cancer care delivery? I've touched on this a lot by talking about the COVID risk and the risk of death for cancer patients, as well as touching on this by talking about the way that the different societies have impacted this. But what this has led to um, over the last two and a half months as we've really been shut down as a society is that there have been fewer screening tests that have been performed and as a result, less cancer being diagnosed. There have been fewer diagnostic tests that have been performed, so we haven't been able to qualify the types of cancer that we've been finding. There are fewer new consults happening right now in cancer clinics, less frequent visits, and all of these first four bullets are actually impacting practices as well. Um, when you have fewer cancer visits, the 
practice is less busy and makes less money. And so many can cancer practices across the country have actually suffered from a decrease in volume over the last few months, which impacts their ability to deliver care. Uh, many physicians have had to take pay cuts. And it's the great irony of the COVID pandemic that it's actually made doctors outside of certain hotspots and certain subspecialties um, actually less busy. And so it's something that we as a society, as this COVID pandemic continues on, is something that we have to really talk about. And you can see some of these. There have been articles in the New York Times that have been sort of displaying these ironies. Um, in order to adapt to this, physicians and physician practices have really uh, become very reliant on telehealth or telemedicine. Um, and this allows for more patient interactions without the increased risk to healthcare providers and to patients. But there are limits to telemedicine as well, which is that physicians are not able to do a full physical exam. And what ends up happening in these types of visits is that there are directed physical exams, which means that um, patients can be seen and therefore sort of general physical exam things can be seen over the, over the tele, telemedicine platform. But mostly the doctors are doing physical exams based on questions and asking whether or not patients have symptoms. And then depending on the types of symptoms they have, the doctor might ask the patient to be, to be brought in for a specific type of physical exam um, based on the patient's symptoms. And so as a result, this is not a traditional physical exam and there's increased risk as a result of this. Sometimes patients don't report symptoms and do have physical exam findings that we're now missing. Um, there also is a potential risk of patients who might minimize their oncology symptoms because they don't wanna be hospitalized and they don't wanna come in. Um, we talked already about the decrease, the decreased numbers and the delays of surgery that might otherwise be necessary. And now that we're almost three months into the COVID pandemic, there is the question of how long can we delay things when the risk hasn't really come down too much, um, at least in most parts of the country. And then there's the question of um, recognizing that we don't have the data. Um, and so we don't know whether or not it's truly safe and truly effective to do telehealth visits to be able to limit these numbers of patients. And, what this actually means for the provision of cancer care. Are patients going to be safely treated with their cancer, given that they're not able to come in as often, they're not getting as many tests. So we're stuck with basically the likelihood of having increased deaths in cancer patients from two different causes. The first is from COVID-19, which we've really detailed. Um, there are fewer healthcare visits that are, that are happening. Um, there's a decreased likelihood of cancer screening. There's a decreased likelihood of getting treatment. And all of these things are potential risks for patients who don't even have COVID-19. Um, patients who don't have COVID-19 are less likely to be able to get some of the treatments that they need for their cancer, and that might lead to increased deaths. On the other hand, on the other hand cancer itself might make people uh, more likely to get COVID-19 uh, simply because they have a more of an immune system dysfunction. They, might have high, they are likely to have a higher mortality from COVID-19, as we discussed. And you bring both of these together and cancer increases the risk of death in general, especially untreated cancer, and COVID-19 increases the death rate of patients with cancer, and we have potentially a perfect storm in patients who have cancer where their outcomes are uh, potentially worse. So let's move on and see where does research impact this and where does research come in? Um, and we wanna talk about two things here. The first is, can we safely continue doing research trials while we're, while we're in the midst of COVID-19? Does it continue to be something that we should be doing and is worthwhile to do? And number two is, what has the COVID-19 pandemic done to accruals onto clinical trials in general? So there are actually risks and benefits in clinical research under COVID-19. The, the, the column on the left, uh, it talks about some of the benefits of continuing to do research. The column on the right is talking about some of the risks in continuing to do cancer research. And Generally speaking, all of the benefits of cancer research continue to be there. Um, the most important is in patients who have a risk of COVID-19, there is continued benefit of therapy um, in patients who are already getting benefit when they're on a clinical trial. Somebody who's on a clinical trial and doing well on that clinical trial, we should assume that there are those patients, especially in interventional trials, are benefiting from being on that clinical trial. Do we want to remove that benefit for the, from those patients? Um, additionally, there is a potential benefit from experimental therapy. Most of the studies that we do um, in our business are using drugs that we hope are going to be more effective than what the patients might otherwise have access to. Um, patients who are on clinical trial tend to have um, study navigation and, and care navigation that's provided to them that is beyond what they might get in standard of care. 
And therefore, having a health system and a healthcare team that's looking at them more closely because they're on a clinical trial could provide benefit as well. There continues to be a social benefit from research. Um, our society benefits from being able to do research. We're able to get new therapies, and that shouldn't be discounted. Um, and then in, a, in addition, we now are having a large natural experiment. And at the risk of sounding crass, we're going to be able to learn a lot about what happens to patients when there's that higher risk of COVID-19 on our clinical trials. Um, and uh, on the other hand, there are the obvious risks. So a risk of patient, um, because of their increased number of visits, that they might have higher exposure to the virus and therefore an increased risk of death. Um, there's the risk to caregivers and medical staff from the increased number of interactions with patients. And as a result, there's a higher risk from, uh, to other patients as well if the staff is more likely to get COVID. Um, there is a potential risk to trial integrity, and that's especially important to those on the phone because there are gonna be a higher number of deviations. Um, there are going to be a higher number of patients who are not going to get exactly the uh, time points of therapy that the trials otherwise would want them to have. And therefore we're gonna have a little bit more observational type work rather than the interventional type of work that we're going to be otherwise seeing when, when we were not in the pandemic. And the toxicity of trials might actually increase the risk of COVID-19 severity. I talked before about the risk of having uh, grade four, three or four adverse events on a clinical trial, and we talk about these all the time. Many of our trials are actually looking at severe toxicity as an endpoint in our trials, and that might make patients more likely to be able to get COVID-19 because they're having more, uh, um, more visits due to the toxicity, and they also might be more likely to have severe COVID-19 uh, severe COVID-19 disease because they are having side effects from their therapy. So all of these risks are, should not be discounted. Um, while there are benefits to continuing research, there are increasing toxicities, both to patients, healthcare providers, and to the trials themselves. And I think that that's something that we really need to think about as we're moving forward with clinical research during the COVID pandemic. Um, as a result of some of these things, we've seen um, both among sites, CROs, and sponsors, that there's a higher reliance um, to a number of different things under the COVID pandemic than we had seen before. The first, and I've talked about this already, is telemedicine and telehealth. This is happening. Um, and it's going to be happening on clinical trials, whether we like it or not. Um, this has a positive impact because it allows for more patients to be treated with clini on clinical trials than otherwise would have been. But it might make it more difficult to be able to explain risks and benefits to patients who have not yet given consent. It might make it more difficult to obtain informed consent from patients. What's important to recognize is as long as patients sign a hard copy of a consent form, believe it or not, most IRBs, including central IRBs, commercial IRBs, and most local IRBs don't require specific permission from that study to be able to obtain what's referred to as electronic consent. So there's a difference between electronic consent and uh, remote consent. Remote consent still has the patient sign a hard copy of a document. And that doesn't always need to happen in the presence, um, in the physical presence of study staff. Uh, and so it's possible to do informed consent even for interventional studies as long as a patient has a copy of that consent form, signs it, and in some way gets it back to the study staff where the study staff is able to sign it, say that they witnessed it over telemedicine. And I don't mean to get into the weeds on this, but it's something for sponsors to recognize that consent itself is not a major barrier to being able to enroll patients on clinical trials um, during this time period, even with the advent of telemedicine. Um, there's also a decreased regulatory burden that um, most IRBs, including and all the way up to the level of the FDA, have stated. Um, it opens things up to remote consent, as I mentioned before. It allows for minor protocol deviations um, from an IRB perspective that limit healthcare interactions without penalty. So, for example, if a patient was otherwise going to get a, uh, a CT scan at a time that they otherwise were not going to get a visit, that you push the CT scan off or you make the CT scan earlier so that it coincides so that it coincides with when they needed to get their standard of care visit anyway. Um, taking deviations as a result of uh, times that the patient was just gonna come in to get checked in, but it wasn't gonna be a treatment visit, uh, those might be able to go away with just a minor deviation. And so while ultimately it's up to the sponsor, the guidance that we've been getting from IRBs and the guidance that we've been getting from, uh, from the FDA and the NCI and the NIH have all said that these minor deviations certainly can be allowed even for registrational studies going forward. And so sponsors can take a look at that as well. Um, another change that we've seen for research is that patients are less likely to want to come into the office. There is no way to get rid of every extra visit that patients end up getting. Um, and as a result, because the patients don't want to come in at all, 
if you're going to be going on to a clinical study that's going to be treating a patient every week instead of what they would have gotten in standard of care, which is every three weeks, a patient might be less likely to want to participate in that type of study. And so those studies might suffer from enrollment problems. Um, we have seen, at least in terms of by report, at least from the cooperative groups, that there have been significant decreases in patient accrual, at least during the early weeks of this pandemic, um, because we hadn't really been able to implement some of the changes before. Um, the three major cooperative groups in the United States are, uh, that are impacted by COVID-19 are ECOG Akron, um, the NRG, which is made up of the NSABP, the RTOG, and the GOG, and SWOG. And all of these uh, groups have reported anywhere from about a third to about a half of patients going on to clinical trials, um, a decrease of about 30 to 50 percent during that period. Um, uh, and that's largely due to um, hesitation among sites and sponsors to allow business to continue to go on as usual. Um, both institutions and sponsors have been temporarily halting clinical research. Um, the ones that have tended to be halted the most tend to be observational trials because those trials require visits that otherwise are not going to be benefiting the patients because there's no intervention. Trials that have really suffered are screening trials as well. Symptom management trials have particularly suffered. And then placebo-controlled trials have suffered as well because it's difficult for physicians to justify to the patient when there's a 50% chance that the patient's going to be getting no intervention at all, but still getting a placebo that they have to come in for a 50% chance of getting absolutely nothing and just exposing themselves to clinical research. Placebo-controlled trials in cancer are usually limited to curative intent, um, usually in the adjuvant or neoadjuvant setting, um, where there is no better therapy that's been designated. Um, adjuvant trials tend to suffer a little bit as well, depending on whether or not they're placebo controlled. And then there are a lot of sites that have stopped all new accruals. Um, there are sites that just say, you know what, this risk is a little bit too high and, we're, and the regulatory burden to try to be able to get all of these things to happen and to change the way we're doing business in general is just not worth it. And we've seen a number of sites say, you know what, we're shutting down for, um, new accruals due to, the, due to this. Uh, there are also certain industry trials where the sponsors themselves have said, you know what, we're not willing to take the risk of COVID into account, and the patients need to come in for every single visit, just like they were doing before. And many sites say, you know what, we're not willing to do that. Um, and so there have been studies that um, centers that I've been associated with have basically had to internally close those studies because the sponsor was not willing to be able to take those deviations into account. And that's something that each sponsor needs to think about. Um, because it's not appropriate right now for sponsors to say, business as usual, we're ignoring COVID. Um, that's neither responsible conduct, nor is it uh, what's happening in general in the industry. And so I would caution those sponsors from basically saying, we need to continue to do business as usual and, and, uh, and not take those things into account. Um, and that is gonna impact accrual to some extent if a sponsor says, no, you have to, you know, sites will balk. Um, CROs will balk. They, they will not say, we are just going to allow these trials to continue as usual. They will shut those trials down, and we've seen that happen. So what do we talk about next? So how do we try to make it so that we can get research to move forward at a site level and at a sponsor level? Um, and I'm a little bit over time here, so I want to apologize, um, but this is the last section that we're going to be talking about. Um, so what most sites have done and what most sponsors have done is, of course, give the highest priority to patients who are going to be continuing on active treatment. Um, it is the most important thing to recognize that patients who are on active treatment are most likely to be benefiting from that treatment. And stopping a, can a cancer trial in the middle of a treatment for patients is largely unethical. Um, and so patients who are on trial need to stay on trial. And that's really been the first thing that most sites and most sponsors have been trying to prioritize during the last two months um, is make sure that those patients who are on study can stay on study. Those patients who are getting active drug can continue to get active drug. Um, the second thing that really has to happen is um, that the staff um, and the CROs really need to stay in contact with their sites and their study participants to make sure that the safety concerns or the willingness to continue on study are addressed to those patients. Um, the IRBs and generally uh, um, the, uh, the national institutions are making sure that we recognize that the risks have changed for our patients and that patients should be asked about whether or not they want to continue on study um, with the increased risks of the COVID pandemic. Uh, in effect, you know, every informed consent process includes an assessment of risks and benefits. And with the COVID risk 
that changes the risks and benefits for patients participating on study and those patients um, and the study participants and the sites need to be able to communicate that to patients. And that should be provided by the, the sponsors and the CROs. Um, generally speaking, for patients on active studies, um, what we're really recommending and what most sites are doing is they're doing what they can to collapse studies into those where they're gonna be getting therapeutic visits. So combining visits or limiting those visits there where medic, uh, into studies where medical care is already being performed. And being a little bit lax as far as that's concerned from a sponsor perspective is quite important. Um, allowing for telehealth visits for follow-up um, when whenever appropriate is something that sponsors can do as well. Um, generally speaking, unless the sponsor says otherwise, most sites are not asking permission. They're just telling sponsors that they're doing this. Um, and the IRBs are okay with this as well. Um, and then again, like I mentioned, patients should be informed of the risk of COVID-19 and again, given the, given the opportunity to withdraw. And we should communicate to our sites that this is something that we expect. Um, the question of new subjects on clinical trials, there is a path forward to putting patients on clinical trials um, right now that are already open. Remember that the reason that most patients who give consent for clinical research are doing it because the research study is the best possible cancer care. Um, that's something that the NCCN says very clearly that clinical trials are the best care available for cancer patients and that when available, a clinical trial should be considered to be the same as standard therapy, if not better. Um, however, there are certain studies that it's not the case. And so generally speaking, what a lot of sites have done is they've asked for um, physician approval um, before either from the primary investigator locally of the study or the medical director of research at each site um, to approve each patient going forward on an interventional study. Generally speaking, I consider that site level intervention um, where the PI has to determine whether or not a patient is at higher risk to be sufficient. I don't think that a CRO or a sponsor needs to get down into the nitty gritty to be able to determine whether or not each individual patient has a different increased risk for going on to study during COVID. Where a sponsor and a CRO can, just can, um, can intervene and where I believe it's appropriate for them to, to intervene is whether or not the study is going to be kept open in general. And that's something that each sponsor really should take a hard look at their study and say, is this study really at the best interest of all of the patients going on to the clinical study or not? And should the study remain open for approval? Um, most sites have research committees um, and research committees at sites might decide to internally halt enrollment. Um, and when CROs and sponsors are looking at site performance during this period, they should be wary of holding sites accountable to research enrollment um, uh, um, predictions that they had done in the past because some sites might internally halt enrollment. And again, that's particularly the case for adjuvant studies with placebo controls. Um, we need to, as a, as a um, industry, we need to allow for remote informed consent. Um, that's not the same thing as virtual consent. Um, it's not the same thing as electronic consent. It means that we allow, as I talked about before, it means that we should allow for patients to give consent from afar as long as they sign a consent form. Um, there can be sponsor requirements for remote informed consent. Here's an example at the end of this. So if you allow, for example, a patient to have a copy of the informed consent, sign that copy of the informed consent, send it in, um, make sure that that copy of the informed consent is signed at least over the television, over the telehealth visit um, with study personnel and the PI or the PI depending on the study. Um, make sure that it's documented who conducted the consent decision and the, the consent discussion. Um, document that the patient was able to uh, ask questions and express concerns. All of this stuff which has been done in person in the, in the past can be done remotely. And then make sure the patient's got a signed copy of the informed consent and sends their signed copy in in some form or another, whether it's by scan and email or by hard copy and mail to the study site so that they can put that in the study binder. And this is something that CROs can communicate. This is something that sites can communicate. This is something that IRBs can communicate and something that sponsors can communicate. Um, opening new studies in general has run into a little bit more of pushback. Most of the reason that new study pushback has come into, has come into effect is because of two uh, main reasons. The first is all of these new changes that have happened has really taxed research departments at sites. Um, it's very difficult to keep up with the poli new policies and policy changes that have occurred on a site level with each individual research study. And therefore, because that it required all hands on deck from a regulatory perspective and from a uh, 
uh, consent and, and treatment level perspective and all of these deviations that are occurring, the bandwidth of sites to be able to start new studies has gone down a little bit. Um, and so as a result, some sites are saying no new studies for now. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that we shouldn't, as an industry, stop new studies. It just means that there needs to be a little bit of, of um, understanding that's put into account when we're talking to, new, to sites. And we should ask sites, are they stopping new studies overall? Are they stopping putting new patients on clinical trials? Or is it just going to be a bit of a delay? Um, and that they anticipate that there are going to be initiation of new studies that are happening. Um, the other reason, as I mentioned, that, that new studies um, may be halted is because um, sponsors are stopping new studies, uh, that this takes a lot of work on the part of sponsors. Um, and so while there might be, and that might be because there are certain uh, requirements that sponsors have to initiate new studies, be they SIVs, be they site qualification visits, be they on-site monitoring that needs to happen um, at first patient, all of those things kind of stress what the policies of CROs and the sponsors have been. And without modification of those policies, it might be almost impossible for studies that are being responsible and not letting study monitors and uh, sponsor or CRO representatives on site um, to be able to launch those new studies. And so that's something that sponsors and CROs really need to take into consideration and allow for those things that are being done remotely to continue to, that are able to be done remotely, to be done remotely um, so that sites can, in a responsible fashion, start new studies without having to have people on site. Um, that leads into the in-person study monitoring. Most sites in the US at, at this point still do not allow um, on-site study monitoring. However, in order for sites to get paid historically, there needs to be in-person monitoring at sites. Most sponsors and most CROs have already shifted to some extent to allowing for remote monitoring, but there are barriers to doing remote monitoring. Uh, there are a lot of sites that still do uh, that still do hard copies of a lot of their study binders that are not put into the electronic medical record. And it can be difficult for sites to, um, to get that data in, over to sponsors um, when sponsors and CROs need to see a hard copy. There are uh, problems with data security by giving access to the electronic medical record offsite. Um, that, can be, that can be possible and probable. But most sites, at least right now, are still not allowing for in-person study monitoring because most sites have the study monitoring that occurs in the clinic and bringing people outside to the clinic who otherwise don't need to for medical reasons to be in the clinic can be a real risk. Um, and so it's important for sites and CROs and sponsors to work really closely together to encourage the ability to do remote monitoring and to encourage the ability to have payments where possible from remote monitoring or other types of uh, of, um, uh, of mechanisms. And again, you know, I, I work at a site in addition to uh, working with CROs, and I can tell you that, that um, while the first few months of this pandemic, I think it's very possible to be able to do studies um, without getting in-person study monitoring in place. As this uh, pandemic drags on, um, if in-person study monitoring continues to not be allowed, there's going to be a major problem with clinical research um, because the clinical research uh, uh, departments do require the ability to get paid at some point uh, for the work that they're doing. And so this is something that, that should be taken into account um, as this drags on. Um, so the other issue that I want to talk about uh, a little bit more um, in depth is how this has impacted observational research. There's a lot of observational research that's been going on, big data research, um, uh, large observational trials trying to look at long-term outcomes of patients who have been getting therapy in the clinical uh, standard of care setting. And most centers have stopped doing observational trials in the way that they had been done, doing with them before. Um, there have been really three models that centers have taken into account. Um, the first is that a lot of centers have said no new observational enrollment at all. Um, and all observational trials have stopped. Um, I anticipate that in the months to come, that's going to change to some extent um, because there is going to continue to be the need to do observational studies. And this isn't something that we're willing to just kind of stop the provision of cancer care advancement for years at a time. Um, the second model, which is the one that I actually um, uh, encourage is um, not, it, well, I don't have a problem starting new observational trials, although some sites do, but generally converting all observational enrollments and visits to televisits um, to replace all in-person encounters that are necessary just for the trial to having televisits for, for uh, 
um, for these types of studies, I think is quite important. And the third one, which is something that we're probably going to be moving toward over time, um, is, is just allowing new observational trials and allowing limited, limited observational visits, especially for labs, because there are interventions for the lab, um, and to allow for telemedicine whenever it's possible to do so. Um, all of this changes. Um, what's the policy of a site? What's the policy of a CRO? What's the policy of a sponsor? Policy of the sponsor is changing on a week-to-week -week basis, and so it becomes difficult to be able to keep a track of everybody's changes. And in an ideal world, there would be one set of policies across all industry, across all CROs, and across all sites for how they're going to handle clinical trials, and that one policy would change. But we live in a world where there is um, a, a lot of different competition among clinical trials, um, among sponsors, among CROs, and everybody has their own policy, and that's not going to change. Finally, I want to give a word to biospecimen only studies. Um, these types of studies really, um, because by definition, they include a study visit um, uh, specifically just to obtain a biospecimen, and there usually is close contact, uh, physical contact between the lab professional or the um, interventional radiologist who's obtaining that biospecimen and the patient. We need to be a little bit careful about those studies unless there's really minimal risk. So if it's blood drawing that's happening at the time of uh, what, uh, what otherwise would be a standard of care blood draw, that's probably okay. Um, but we need to be a little bit careful in pushing biospecimen studies during the acute phases of this. Um, it is totally reasonable for us as uh, sponsors and CROs to encourage communication from sites during COVID. Sites should not just kind of be doing whatever they're doing willy-nilly. But at the same time, asking permission for every single minor deviation that's going to occur is probably not practical. Um, and so what has often been recommended is that sites should let sponsors know when they're going to be doing these types of deviations, take really good records, make sure that if there is going to be a deviation that sites document um, very closely what those deviations are and why they're happening, um, and then inform the study sponsor or the study CRO um, that these are happening, but this is one of those things where the study, the studies are going to have to ask for forgiveness rather than part of, rather than permission. Um, it's just not practical to ask sites to do this. And I think that most of you and most of the people who've been involved on the CRO or sponsor side have come to appreciate this over time. And that's actually in line with what the FDA um, and what the NCI have been recommending. Um, so finally, I want to just talk a little bit about what is going to change once this ends and what's probably not going to change. So um, you've probably gotten from, my, from the sense of what I've been saying that COVID isn't going away tomorrow. Um, and I, I'm sorry to, if you did not know that, I'm sorry to be the bearer of uncertain and relatively bad news, but we're going to have a higher risk of COVID probably through all of 2020 and probably into 2021. Hopefully there will be a vaccine during that period at some point, but this risk isn't going away. Um, we've had about a million and a half cases in the United States already, um, but you have to remember that there are 300 million, over 300 million people in the United States, and this represents a very small amount of the population, and none of us have immunity to this disease. So um, until there is a vaccine, this is going to be in our population to at least some extent. Um, because we can't stop all research and we can't stop all clinical care, just because of this risk of COVID, new studies are gonna to start to open, new studies are going to um, uh, continue to open up and clinical facilities are gonna start opening up as well. We can't push off cancer care for so long. And so as a result, it's important to be in touch with sites um, and especially those sites who have stopped clinical research during the, COVID, during the COVID pandemic and continually asking them, are you reopening? Um, what are you reopening for? Most sites have policies that they are, uh, that in their clinical research departments, they're keeping relatively updated. Um, some sites are being, are even planning um, or have already reopened for in-person monitoring. Um, and a few things we're expecting after COVID finally ends are going to go back to normal. Certainly study audits need to be done on site and that's not going to change. Um, study visits are going to start to separate from standard of care visits, like I mentioned. Um, right now, a lot of them have been collapsed into one another. And some SIVs, at least, will go back to on-site, probably interventional studies where the, uh, where the CRO or the sponsor needs to um, uh, be uh, assured that the uh, study material has made it to the site, that the lab is where it needs to be, that the pharmacy is where it needs to be. Some of these will go back 
Um, what probably will not go back um, is the telemedicine is not going to go away. There are going to continue to be telemedicine visits. Um, this had, you know, telemedicine is something that had been happening somewhat sporadically before COVID, but it was always going to be the way of the future. And this has catapulted the field of medical care into telemedicine in a way that had not been anticipated for probably, um, you know, three to five years. And we're now where we thought we were going to be as a field in medicine, where we had not expected to be. And this isn't going to go away for clinical research. And so um, study calendars that are built by sponsors and CROs should really look at the idea of having remote visits whenever possible. Um, remote informed consent is likely to continue, and this is something that should be built into protocols um, and built into study calendars. Um, study monitoring is going to be revamped. We're probably going to start allowing remote monitoring much more commonly. Um, that's going to have to take into trial workforces. You know, right now there are huge numbers of people who have whose job it is to travel to the site, um, uh, one site after another, and that's something that might go down um, as remote monitoring becomes um, more of a norm. Um, and the reason this isn't going to change back is simply because there isn't a good reason for it to change back. Once there's remote monitoring capabilities, there's no reason to have somebody on site as many times, although there will probably be in-site visits that continue, on-site visits that continue. There's going to be some informed consent that's going to happen in person, and it might be on a study-by-study -study basis. Um, what's going to also probably happen is that sponsored protocol development is going to finally start allowing for less strict eligibility. It's going to be a nice-to-have rather than a need-to-have uh, assessment. Um, that's going to, and that's something that the NCI has been pushing for quite some time. Um, do we really need to have the labs be as restrictive as they need to be? Does the patient really have to have that, you know, uh, 16, 18, 24 hour PK that they otherwise probably didn't need to have? Um, and so uh, study sponsors, as they write protocols, are going to need to take into account that every study visit has a more than likely minimal risk to those patients and really write in the ability to be a little bit more lax in terms of study eligibility and those study visits. Um, and sponsors are going to reevaluate what needs to be done in person. Um, investigator meetings are less likely to happen in person. Steering committee meetings are less likely to happen in person. Um, uh, advisory boards are possibly less likely to happen in person. Uh, the world is changing and we've learned to do more virtually and I think that that's something that is not going to change back 100%. And I'm not saying that there isn't real value in having face-to-face -face communication and having people in a room together, um, but it's not going to go back to the way it was where there's going to be quite as much travel as there was before. So finally, um, I know we're running out of time and I want to be able to answer a couple of questions. Um, as I mentioned, COVID-19 poses a unique risk to cancer patients um, that there are clinical recommendations that are changing um, the level and changing the way that we produce cancer care during the pandemic. Um, clinical research has been hit during the pandemic, but there are ways to be able to bring it back um, as long as we perform research modifications on the sponsor site and uh, CRO side. And some of these modifications are going to be long term. So I'll wrap it up there. Um, I want to let Sean Hart speak for a little bit, and then I'm happy to answer questions in the last few minutes. Thank you, Ari. Uh, this is Sean Hart. Uh, from all of us at George Clinical, Ari, I want to thank you for your time and, and careful detail in this presentation and your professionalism to give us the insight to um, how the world is changing uh, due to COVID-19, especially in oncology trials. Um, just to give people a, a quick note, uh, Ari and I have worked together for a long time. Uh, we have a strong belief here at George Clinical that scientific leadership is, is vital to drive the studies that we conduct. Uh, we, we manage for our clients in the pharmaceutical and biotech space. We believe uh, the knowledge that the scientists and expert scientists and medics bring to, to help drive everything from protocol um, creation to, to manage at the site level, to uh, educate, uh, to keep us informed of standard of care is, um, is, is so very, very important. Um, a little, a little different about us here, at George Clinical. Um, our roots actually started in Asia Pacific, and then as as time went on, we grew uh, into Europe and the United States. And I say it's a little different because it, it gives us a different perspective on studies. Uh, obviously, things like COVID nineteen were affecting us um, very early uh, in, 
in the pandemic back in, in October, we were doing assessments and risk assessments and thinking about remote monitoring and things like that uh, because it was hitting China and China is one of the places where we have um, a large office, a number of offices. So um, to the point of, of Ari, we do have a key area of focus. One of our true key, key areas of focus is oncology. We, we've seen this affect us in the 38 countries we're, we're in right now. Um, and running oncology studies, uh, and each one is a little different, I meaning each country and, and how it's being affected. But just to summarize, we, we do believe uh, as a company that, that to offer best in class science allows us to, uh, to, to, to drive our service and the services that we create for our pharmaceutical clients uh, to focus on the solutions we bring. And this is clearly one of those, those areas where, where study uh, participation and enrollment uh, and, and, and as the pandemic spread has affected us differently, where China is now much more up and running, the U.S., as Ari has mentioned, uh, North America uh, slowed down and we're kind of coming out of those times now. But I guess if there is one, um, I don't even know if it's a silver lining, but, but, but a stop like we've all done with the shelter in place and working remotely is looking at every single process we have, um, starting again last October and allowing it to, uh, to get into full effect now with, with the remote-based healthcare, the remote-based monitoring, um, allowing us to use those, those processes and that change to, um, to continue where we can um, to enroll the studies that we're up and running and, and to bring new solutions to the ones that are, uh, that are here in front of us. But we thank you very much, Ari, uh, as, as the Chief Business Officer of, of, of George Clinical. I look forward to working with you closely. So why don't we give you some time back to answer a few of the questions. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Sure. Mr. Vanderall, we've got just a couple questions. Um, so first, uh, I think back on slide eight of your presentation uh, today, you'd mentioned guidelines for treatment. Obviously those were evolving a bit. Uh, the question revolves around would, the, would these guidelines impact the decisions of investigators or even the patients themselves and their willingness to participate in a clinical trial um, due to not wanting to risk uh, some of the unknowns right now in treatment? So the short answer to that question is yes. Um, and I think this is something that has to be communicated to patients that these risks and the way that these societies are uh, changing their prioritization um, might change the way that patients uh, view this as well. Patients are an independent entity that are able to evaluate risks and benefits themselves um, and they just need to be informed. Um, and so it is important um, for, for investigators um, and CROs to make sure that the patients are given the same degree of information um, that the sites are given. Um, and they, it might impact their, their willingness to undertake risk. Um, that's added to the ability to undertake risk that they already have to do uh, for cancer studies. And it should be part of the uh, consent process. Second question we have is a, just a simple logistical question, doctor. How will patients be screened for COVID-19 typically during the recruitment process for current trials or upcoming trials? Um, so that's a good question. And generally speaking, most sites are not particularly screening for COVID-19 in patients who are looking at trials. Um, there are generalized universal screenings for patients who are coming into clinics in general and most oncology um, research departments are within a broader oncology clinic. There are very few cancer only, uh, study only clinics. And all clinics have universal screening guidelines. So they take temperatures when patients come in, patients are asked specific questions to see whether or not they've been at risk, if they've had travel, if they've had exposure to somebody who's had COVID and whether or not they've had any symptoms. And that general um, type of questioning that occurs at the clinic level, I believe is sufficient for patients who are otherwise going to go on to clinical trial. I don't think that it's necessary to have a patient take a swab for COVID before they go on to the study, unless they have symptoms. Understood, we'll take one last question, uh, just here in the interest of time. Oncology trials are typically a, a last resort for patients, um, meaning they obviously are typically very ill at that point. Uh, how and when should, should oncology trials be suspended? I mean, what's the easiest criteria for deciding that there's obviously a severe risk uh, for the existing disease completely separate from COVID-19? So it's a, it's a good question. I wanna challenge the assumption that that 
clinical trials are only last risk. In fact, the best clinical trials right now that are available are usually instead of a good standard of care that's available for patients that we expect to be regular, uh, that we expect to be even better standard of care. First line trials, second line trials, adjuvant trials. But given that there are clinical trials that are late line when there's no good effective additional therapy and those patients tend to be sick, um, clinical trials already have some uh, provisions built in to make sure the patients aren't very sick. Um, there's ECOG performance status requirements usually where they're, um, the patients are still relatively functional. But the point is well taken that um, patients who otherwise were going to go on to hospice probably shouldn't be going on to clinical trials um, simply because you're increasing the risk of them actually getting COVID um, and really a less additional benefit. But I don't think that it's necessary to across the board say, oh, well, we shouldn't be doing clinical research in these patients. I think it should be on a study by study basis and a conversation that occurs from a sponsor, CRO and site level um, to be able to determine whether or not that study is appropriate or not. Excellent. Well, thank you, Dr. Vanderwald, Mr. Hart. Uh, sobering, but I think very insightful and helpful insights during a time that even during pandemic, uh, care must go on, research must go on, and appreciate the insights here. Uh, if you did not get the chance to ask a question today, uh, please uh, submit that online uh, via the George Clinical website, and a member of the business development team will be able to follow up with you directly. Uh, and if you had colleagues who are not able to make this session, it will be recorded and made available shortly. Thank you again all for your attendance today on this topic and have a great day. Thanks, Bradford. Thanks, Eric. Thank you, everybody.